What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. David, what a fantastic guest Lenny Kay was and will be in the future. He is a New York City rock and roll icon. He is a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of the Patti Smith Group. He is also the creator of one of the greatest compilations in the history of rock and roll, Nuggets, which is a show we'll do in the future. But this show was concerned with Lenny's new book, Lightning Striking, 10 Transformative Moments in Rock and Roll, which is out now on HarperCollins. Let me tell you something. As I would say to you earlier, Earlier. There may be 10 great chapters here, but there are really about 10 great books here. Starting with Cleveland, with Alan Freed, going to Memphis. Memphis could be 10 books all by itself. Sun Records, all the great blues artists, Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, and on and on. Carl Perkins, all this great stuff. And then he stacks the deck even more. We do Detroit, where you have, my God, the Stooges, MC5, and Motown. How bizarre a combination is that? It's a great read. And more importantly, as Lenny says, how great that we can literally read the book, go on Google, search out the artist, search out the original recording, and boom, you've got the whole story right there. Yes. Lenny, take us on a journey from Cleveland to Memphis, to New Orleans, to Liverpool, to San Francisco, to Detroit, to New York City. And he talks a little bit about his experience in the Patti Smith group. London 77, LA in 84, and we wind up in Seattle in the 90s. So let's take this Notes from an Artist journey with Lenny K. Let's go. And there he is. Well, hello. Hello, Lenny, you... hello, hello. Good to see you. Lenny, we've actually met before. We go to a place uh, known as Two way treehouse and our friend tom clark oh well then we've definitely <laughs> seen each other times i might be a bit horizontal at the old treehouse and <laughs> tom pours it like he don't own it but <laughs> uh david he is just the um quintessential downtown singer songwriter mm-hmm. tom clark he's from the great, midwest great and he's a great talent i reviewed his records back in the day periodical known as amplifier magazine i don't know if you remember that one lenny but just such a great hang at the treehouse he's also a bartender so not only can you play with him david but you can drink heavily with him. i guess that's good uh, you know. <laughs> but he's a great great musician he's going to join me for my birthday show on february 27th uh, at bowery ballroom and he's been my true running buddy for like you know more than 20 years at this point and uh one of the best people i I've ever known really i great. agree with that and it's nice that you gave him a shout out in lightning strike absolutely absolutely gotta you know tell the world about tom the world <laughs> needs to know you're right the low action boy that was tom clark and the high action boys doing small town new semester this is notes from an artist on cygnusradio.com let me talk about this book. What really struck me and David was the geography of this book, how it traverses Cleveland, Memphis, New Orleans, Liverpool, San Francisco, Detroit, London, L.A. and Seattle. And when you think about these cities, you can actually hear the sound of each of these cities. Each of these cities has an identifiable sound, which played a role in other cities, identifiable sound. I love the local. I love when the local has time to simmer, to kind of change its view of the world. All of these cities that I put on my grand tour of rock and roll's greatest crossings of time and space seem to have a sense of personality that kind of expanded the parameters of the music that we celebrate. It was really fun going on their journey, immersing myself in each one, really deeply listening to not only the superstars that came out of these cities, but the kind of uh, the locals, the Mm. two A's of of each town and how it was kind of an ecology of influences, just the people on stage, but the crowds, what the crowds bring to it, what they want, how they dress, what the social situation surrounding each uh, moment in time. It was a fascinating journey. It took me far longer than I thought, but uh, (laughs) it was in the end, it was really worthwhile because I got to see the whole history of rock and roll in a kind of geographic map. Again, it's so important, uh, the locality of it all. And it's interesting because you can't get to London 77 unless you go through Cleveland 
Cleveland and Memphis. Think about Cleveland and Memphis's influence on artists such as Elvis Costello and The Clash. So- totally. That was Good Rockin' Tonight by Roy Brown back in 1947. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Even though these cities are diverse, they are so interconnected. I certainly enjoyed some of the jokes in the book, like uh, Elvis. <laughs> David, did you know that Elvis anticipated Robert Maplethorpe with his leather outfit in 1960? 19- <laughs> well, what I think is most fascinating, this is really a college course, Lenny. It really uh, typifies so much. And for me, one of the things that struck me about the book is having lived through most of it, it was an intriguing take. Uh the one book that actually isn't in your bibliography that really struck a chord with me, no pun intended, was Arnold Shaw's Honkers and Shouters. Yes, a great book, a great book. I didn't go too much into that kind of pre-rock and roll history. I kind of touched on some of the great uh, sax madmen in the Cleveland prologue. Again, uh, it's such a, a broad, expansive field of, of, I mean, there's many books that I didn't have time to read because I was trying well, to Well, no, no, no. I, I didn't mean it from that <laughs> point of view. I, when we started talking about Roy Brown, yeah, I knew nothing about Roy Brown until I had read Honkers and Shouters, which goes back to about 1990. Right. And so much of, of that kind of music I was unfamiliar with. And I, I, I find it really um, great that you can turn a lot of people onto things like that through this book. I, I think that's a great thing. But I turned myself onto it. I uh, mean, you know, again, I thought I kind of knew these places or kind of knew their overview. But to be honest, really, it was uh, it was just uh, the uh, kind of once I got beneath my own surface, the, the characters I found in the lines of tr- connection and one degree of separation here and to actually see these as as kind of insular moments of, of creativity. It was really a fascinating, you know, and you can go yeah. deep, 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 especially uh, given the resources we have now with uh, right. uh, the internet and availability of music. Some of these records it would have probably taken me months to find and listen to, but I could also... I like- mean, the one that came first to my mind was the um, Joe Hill Lewis. Those first two demos that are available on iTunes, for God's sake. That was Pat Hare doing I'm Gonna Murder My Baby. Wow. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Yeah, it's crazy, uh, you know. But every, you know, every chapter again, you you, you know the, the major names. But to me, they're up on stage. But it's the surrounding seniors, I believe uh, Brian Enia refers to it, where everybody right. is kind of in a community mass, thinking alike, trying to define what this sound is that they hear off in the distance and bringing it in closer. And it's really uh, remarkable that these scenes get a chance to flourish, and a lot of them really are under the radar. Are there even the ones in the major music capitals like New York or even Los Angeles? These scenes come up from the grassroots and they're only recognized by the titans of the music industry after the fact. Then they start getting packaged and then it's time to move on because it becomes a little predictable and defined and almost stereotyped. Right. And when you dig into the history of these cities, as you point out in Detroit, obviously people flock there because of the audio industry. You you mentioned that. But then also you got the influence because they came to Detroit of the deep south of states such as Georgia and Mississippi. And then talk about the mid south, about how Kentucky and Tennessee and they all converged in Detroit. I love your description of the MC5 uh, auto plant rhythm section. I'm going to have to steal that one. Dennis Thompson and, and the great Michael Davis. That was Detroit's own MC5 doing Kick Out the Jams. This is Notes from an Artist on Cygnus Radio. It's amazing when you talk about Detroit, a melting pot within a melting pot of a city. How does one city produce Motown and the Stooges? That was the Stooges doing I Want to Be Your Dog. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Well, we contain multitude, but of course, (laughs) you know, all of them are kind of working class. All of them are kind of marginalized in a certain way. And, uh, you know, Detroit, especially in the late 60s, it's a war zone. And the music reflects that. The music gets angrier. The promise of the summer of love of San Francisco is revealed to be somewhat less uh, accessible than one would think if you're on acid in Golden Gate Park in 1967. <laughs> it's really like, I think times are getting tough and the music reflects that. I mean, I Motown, in a way, was never really 
a you know, they were the hits of America. They didn't right. want to be like Fortune Records, you know, just kind of putting out the records of the underclass in in Detroit. But um, I I love when Motown goes psychedelic. <laughs> it's one of my favorite uh, my favorite periods. Oh my God, they just flip out. That was Ball of Confusion, The Temptations, and isn't it amazing how relevant those lyrics are today? This is notes from an artist, Cygnus Radio. Dot com. And I have to view it through my own kind of perspective. I am a white male rock and roller and play with a great female rock and roller and uh, kind of charts my perspective and journey through the music, kind of a parallel history, as it were. I've never wanted to write a memoir. I'm, I'm not even that interested in myself. I am a, a participant and I am basically a fan. And right. so it's really to see myself mirrored in this music as it becomes more aware of itself, as it grows up, as it moves through its various changes, it kind of seemed to me that I was a minor character in my own evolutionary history of rock and roll. That was Patti Smith with our guest Lenny Kay doing free money from their first recording, Horses. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. You do pop up in the book, of course. Uh, you're in New Brunswick and you're working on your Sing Out collection, right? That's my desire. <laughs> yeah, gotta I, travel on. <laughs> I enjoy the stories of Johnny Cash throwing the chair in 1994 at Ocean Way Studio. That was Johnny Cash doing the Tom Waits tune, Down by the Train. That was on a 1994 recording of Johnny's that basically brought him back into the public eye. It was produced by Rick Rubin, who had changed the name of Deaf American Records to American Recording. This is Notes from an Artist on Cygnus Radio. Com. And as a testimony to being a fan, we're all, uh, I mean, we're all, David and I are bass players, we're fans. Just, right. to, you know, when you stand in the uh, same, on the Holloway Road, in the same place that Joe Meek stood, and you step into his vanishing footprint, and then, David, the phone rings. <laughs> I know, I mean, and I pick it up. That stuff? <laughs> no, I'm just there, and, you know, there's nothing there. It was, it was so spooky. Now, I'm up there in the middle of the night. It's a kind of spooky area of, of London and feeling the ghosts all around. That was Telstar by the Tornadoes, 1962 in Britain. It was written and produced by the aforementioned Joe Meek. And it was number one, both in England and in America. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. When I was in New Orleans and I went to the um, laundromat, which is where Cosmo Metastas Studio was, mm -hmm. and you can go into the back room and there where some of the greatest records in early rock and roll were made. Fats Domino, Lloyd Price, Shirley and Lee, you name it, Miley Lewis. And you're there among the dryers. And you're, I'm just trying to close my eyes and imagine what it was like if the piano was over here and the drums are in the hall and the musicians are like talking about what they did right or did wrong and do they need to do it again and it was a great moment of transportation i really enjoyed the travel to these holy sites i really like to see where it all happened what a spectacular group of four those tracks were so we started with reeling and rocking by fats domino we then went to lordy miss claudy by lloyd price we then went to shirley and lee i'm gone and we ended with smiley lewis with don't jive me those are four tracks recorded at Cosimo Matassa's recording studio, which is in the back of a laundromat in New Orleans. This is Notes from an Artist on Cygnus Radio. Dot com. I was in a band. We were opening for Joe Cocker, and we did Memphis. I think it was fall of 89. Okay. I wish I had had this book then, because <laughs> it would have been a truly amazing two days versus, as musicians, how you spend your two days not knowing how important certain things are. And that's a precursor to what I wanted to say. Growing up in Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, you become completely myopic, particularly pre-internet, because all the British albums came to you first. Because of obviously uh, the Atlantic. And it strikes me that being even more myopic, that most of the folks from Cleveland, Memphis, New Orleans, we heard them. I remember getting uh, uh, the first Meters record for 66 cents. All right. Right near Manny's on uh, by Times Square. So everything comes from New York, whether it comes from New York or New York, was, was the myopic attitude that I had. And even going through Honkers and Charters, um, He's a Rebel, or however many books that I've read, it was magnificent to relive it all through this. And for me, I definitely want to go back to Memphis. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm just fascinated with place when I was in London last November because uh, the book came out uh, over there uh, that month and so my English publisher brought me over and I was staying near Soho I remembered in the book I had talked about this place called the Two Eyes Coffee Bar where the earliest of rock and rollers started playing in a coffee bar because they couldn't serve alcohol and I thought wonder where that is and I looked it up on the web on net and it was within walking distance and I went over there and and uh, it's a fish and chip shop now. But if you go down the stairs to where the stage was, they have like uh, a neon sign saying the Two Eyes Coffee Bar was here. And I just kind of walked there and... and and then I kind of walked upstairs and stood on the street as I might have in 1958, listening to the Viper Skiffle Group or Marty <laughs> Wilde or whoever that might have been there and tried to, again, I'm trying to time travel in a certain mm. way. First up were the Vipers Skiffle Group doing daddy followed by Marty Wilde, Bad Boy. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. Now, when I walk past CBGB, I engage in a little bit of time travel. I don't walk inside John Varvato's or uh, nothing against him. He seems to have preserved the walls and whatever. Yeah. But I, I, I don't, I don't want to mess with my memory of walking in there on any random afternoon for sound check. And there's Hilly chewing on a straw behind <laughs> his little desk. And then you know maybe I'll go over and play the Gorf video game that I used to enjoy in the afternoons and then, you know, see who shows up for soundcheck. That was a live recording of Patti Smith with our special guest, Lenny Kay on guitar, 1979 at CBGB's. The song was called Dancing Barefoot. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. I really like honoring the past. That said, I'm, I'm not really that either nostalgic or even wish things were better then. I don't believe that. You know, music is made in the present tense and the music of the moment is really the soundtrack of today. That doesn't mean that you don't venerate and just dig what happened, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But on the other hand, I'm as interested in what comes over pop radio today with the sound of this moment in time at the beginning of the 21st century when the 21st century is really asserting itself. I mean, if you go back to 100 years to 1920, you're talking of a time when the radio hasn't even been right. invented. Records have just gone flat. <laughs> Movies are still without sound. We're at the beginning of a century that's going to transform the way we listen to music and how music is created. You can even see it now uh, where people don't have to be in the same room to record together. They can send a file or, or do this or that or the other. It's, and instruments can be edited and changed and timbres changed. It's a very exciting time to be a musician. It's interesting you mentioned this. Let's, Lenny, we spoke to uh, John Altman, the great arranger, producer, uh, Sideman. We spoke to Ben Neal, a uh, trumpet player who's done many experimental things. And, and we touched upon this topic because you've been hearing in the news that old music is outselling new music and things like that. And one of the conclusions that we, uh, or one of the ideologies David and I have, which we shared with Altman and Neal, and they both agreed with it, is that one of the reasons why our generation has a problem grasping new music is that the format for example the music that we all grew up on either fell into standard song format right uh i've got rhythm the aaba format or a 12 bar blues and permutations thereof now with let's say tiktok artists there is no verse chorus verse chorus bridge right. or 12 bar repetition now when i was growing up in the 70s and sneaking off to cbgb's because they let underage kids in there now, if i played my elton john records even though my parents didn't care for the platform boot and uh, orange hair of david bowie they could hear the same song format as ray charles and anthony newley when i played rolling stones records or johnny winters records they were like well those english kids are trying to be black musicians so they could hear it with the form but now that we're in in, in the 21st century, there is no song format. As a matter of fact, one what's one of our of the artists we were talking mentioned timbre is now replaced melody and rhythm as a hook. And for example, like a, the algorithms will show if you hear a certain sound every 12 seconds, your brain will respond positively to it. Much different than, you know, let's say Randy Newman or Carol King writing a melody. I think one of the things that's probably confusing to our generation is that the format is different. So we're not we're not speaking the same language in a sense. Well, the format is always different. I mean, mm. we have a three-minute song form because yeah. that's how much they could fit 
on 78s. We have verse and chorus and whatever it is, because maybe it's coming out of vaudeville or it just seems easier to access. But of course, you know, a hundred years before 1920, we're, we're not listening to even folk music. We're, we're listening to chamber orchestras, which have a whole sense of symphony. Things change. It's really the bottom line. And it just as soon as you get comfortable with one mode of dissemination, I mean, I think the fact that you can tap on a computer keyboard and and be anywhere in the world musically is kind of a little self-destructive to this notion of local scenes growing, yeah. but maybe there's different local scenes growing on the internet, little right. pockets of things, especially in the last 30 years and probably 30 years before that, things really accelerate in terms of change. I mean, when I think that I got my first email through something called CompuServe or something, <laughs> you know, uh, in the mid 90s, and it's only like, you know, a quarter century later and now we're talking over cyber technology and it's kind of past couple of years have made it even more screen oriented right what is this going to mean i really don't know and to be honest for me i know how to play guitar i'll entertain myself i'll entertain <laughs> those who will come to see me play but on the other hand i understand that change is very very accelerated these days I just remember driving along with my daughter uh, when she was like around 10 or 11 in the mid 90s and anytime a song would come on the radio with a guitar she'd bang the button <laughs> and move it over to a hip-hop station okay you know we all want our the soundtrack that we own right and i, I think especially in music in in the book the generations are about five years it lasts you know there's a couple years where people are figuring it out they right. really got it figured out maybe in the twos into the threes and then it goes out into the world becomes its own cliche and then it's time to start the circle again. That's why I call it a spiral staircase. You get back to where you started, but you're up a level or down a level, depending on whether you think the change <laughs> is any good or not. Right. <laughs> well, you start the book uh, with Cleveland. And so here we are 70 years later. All right. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits I find of uh, COVID, because there are good things that have occurred, Sweetwater sold over a billion dollars worth of instruments over the last two years. Oh, yeah. And that can only mean good things, I would hope. Another interesting thing is this platform we're on right now, Zoom. When you think about if we count one, two, three, four and start singing, we'll all be out of sync. But <laughs> what's cool about that is this company that Tom and I are involved with because one of our side hustles is we uh, a business called Empower Through Music, where we bring music programs into the New York City schools. Oh, great. This little box has no latency. So conceivably, where you were saying earlier, we'll throw files here and there. Now you can actually play together in real as time. a group wow. in real time. So do we know what's going to happen five years from now? Of course not. But with the ability to make these kind of changes, who knows what's going to happen? And that in itself is fascinating. Musicians are always on the cusp of technology. I mean, David, look at our beloved instrument, the electric bass, right? That was the bastard child of the guitar and the upright bass. But musicians embraced it. And then, of course, the electric bass turned rock and roll into rock music. You know, mm -hmm. look what happened when the DX7 became ubiquitous in the 80s. Look at the effect that had. Don't yeah. use those kind of words. <laughs> <laughs> We all owned one. I, know. I was more of a Roland D50 guy myself. Oh, right. See that? He, here, here. Here. I think you can see it over there. Wow. It's uh, set up somewhere over that part of the uh, whatever. <laughs> one of the things I enjoyed about the book also was being a fly on the wall in 1975 in New York City. Talk okay. about your early days with Patty. And one of the fascinating things about CBs, which I didn't realize, it was a place to watch bands grow and almost like a lab for experimentation. It's yeah. fascinating that you guys would do four night stands. Two okay. sets a night. And yeah. that's really where we got a chance. To, I mean, we we're such a a strange musical combination. We weren't yeah. even quite a band. I mean, we didn't have drums or anything. And right. I always think the long time that it took us to actually become a rock and roll band made it sure that by the time we got to be a rock band, we sounded like ourselves instead of some generic approximation. That was Patti Smith doing the classic Hey Joe. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Being able to play there night after night, explore our improvisations, be somewhat out out of the public eye and yet in the public eye uh it, it, it was really the 
the kind of crucible that fired our band. And uh, by the time we came out of it and we were ready to induct J.D. Dougherty as our official drummer, we kind of had a notion of what we were doing and how to do it, even though, of course, it's a continual learning curve right? Uh, at each step of the way. But yeah, I mean, that's what I like about scenes like that is that CBGB, that you had these misfit bands there, all of whom had a sensibility. It wasn't punk rock. I mean, I say the Ramones were punk rock, whatever that means, mm-hmm. but they were all very different. Tom Verlaine once said, each band was like a different idea. And it's true. Blondie, right. very different than Talking Heads, than the Ramones, than us, than television, to name five. That was another great part of tunes. We started with Blondie live at CB's doing A Girl Should Know Better, followed by the Ramones who did Sniffing Glue also at CBGB's, the last of the CBGB track, Psycho Killer by Talking Heads. And we finished up with the classic glory from Marquee Moon by Television. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. Because we were all kind of jammed together in this little place that was very out of the way, everybody had a chance to figure out what they were doing, essentially learn how to play, which right. uh, most everybody needed because we're on grounds that are not that figured out. I mean, mm. It wasn't like, you know, we're jazz players, we're going to Berkeley and then we're going to play, you know, all those, you know, Chinese chords and stuff. And everybody <laughs> was learning how to make their music and it was a unique music. And uh, then it went out into the world and, and had its own influences, which, of course, I'm, you know, totally grateful to, to be an influence as well as having been influenced myself over the many years is, is, is a great honor. Interesting that you mentioned that John Kell said he challenged you not to settle for anything less than as far as you could go. Yeah, and he drove us crazy. And that's why <laughs> Birdland, which I mean, of all the songs on on the on horses, Birdland is the one that kind of incandescent, incandescented the most in the studio because it had started as a little three minute poem with, you know, some musical backing and we wanted to record it live and John wanted to layer and he was into his Brian Wilson period. And uh, we said, no, no, no. And he just kept pushing us. And I believe there's a version, version somewhere around the six minute mark where we're thinking, yeah, this is this is pretty good. But he kept just driving us crazy. And finally, we hit that one that's that's on horses uh, pass, we cruise past the nine minute mark and created something on the spot that you were just listening to Birdland. And before that, Birdland. And that first Birdland was Patti Smith and her band, featuring our guest Lenny Kay. That was done in 1975, followed by Weather Report. Their version of Birdland was done in 1977. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I'm glad you point out, do not underestimate the Ramones savvy. They eliminated the unnecessary and focused on the substance. When I was a uh, music student back in the in 1980 in University of Miami, they would, my jazz colleagues would mock the Ramones about their technique. And I had to explain to him that there was a method to D.D. Ramon's technique, David. As a bass player, you have to hold the bass below your knees because yeah. if you're going to play 30-second notes, you can't do it for them. got to do it with your wrist. So uh-huh. that is it. That is an actual technique. So for those of you studying uh, D.D. Ramon, that wasn't that wasn't just for aesthetics. That just wasn't for the punk look. That was I mean, actually... they, they were quite quite an art project, I have to say. They weren't dumb. You know, they had the look. They had the, the songs to match. And, you know, maybe this was all they could play. But if you start playing Ramon songs, I mean, I've played Beat on the Brat and I've played Rockaway Beach. And they're not easy to play. All of a sudden, you know, the chord change comes up, you know, and whoosh, you're over here. And then <laughs> you're over here and it's not just your one four five like a blues there's got a lot of kind of twists and t- it's kind of like being a race car driver you're going around these curves go, whoa and then whoa, whoa and to pack all that into a 25 minute set that was that was very impressive yeah yeah but um particularly but- when you're thinking that they were surreptitiously doing beach boys and and Phil <laughs> absolutely Spencer, which no one really thought about until <laughs> wait a second I know that sound. It was. It really was fabulous. Sometimes you know that song. <laughs> well, that's true too. But the other thing is, as you're saying, with the, with those subtle nuances, it's because they heard it that way, and they had enough strength of character to go. I hear it this way. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah, it's like really, Tommy Ramone, better. you know, cl- cleaning up the drums. There's no fills, you know. He's just accenting with the with the symbols and and driving it forward and catching all these off beats and and sudden 
twists in the music. Right. It's uh, it's it's very it's very smart. But it's like the Stooges. Uh, I, I think there's a point in the book where Danny Fields were up at an alternative media conference up in Vermont, uh, taking acid and wandering the woods and trying to figure out ways to overthrow the world. Danny is on the phone with Iggy long distance and he's in a phone booth, and they, Iggy plays a little bit of Funhouse. So uh, I could hear it. And he says to Danny, nobody's ever going to say that we can't play anymore. And I mm -hmm. believe that's true, because if you listen, even to the first two Stooges out, Scott Ashton's drumming is very precise, very militaristic. It's not just like boom, chick, boom, boom, chick. You know, it's got a lot of counter rhythms going on. And uh, the songs, they might have written them two nights before they went in the studio, but they're songs that have lived through the ages. Yeah, sure. At the same time, you could say the same thing. I mean, look, uh, Malcolm McLaren, uh, what was it, Rock and Roll Swindle. What the real swindle was, the fake that these guys couldn't play. Exactly. Right. Now, if you take God Save the Queen, I think that little drum fill, that short little fill, maybe mm -hmm. one of the great, I think it typifies yeah, Paul Cook. rock drumming. Just that little bit, because it was just, it was perfect. God Save the Queen, the Sex Pistols. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. And they could play. Oh, yeah. I mean, Anarchy in the UK, somewhere around the end of the second chorus or something, where Steve Jones takes kind of a, a monosyllabic solo, and then the feedback note just keeps on going through the verse. Like, yeah. like a piece of tension. In a, in a way, the sex, you know, I know Malcolm wanted also to, everyone wants to overthrow the world. Jesus, I don't know what they would do with it. But uh, I think the Sex Pistols were too good for him. And he kind of painted them into a corner. They painted themselves into a corner in that moment in the San Francisco uh, Winterland show, which is their last show in Johnny Rotten kind of breaks character and just squats on the floor and, you know, real, realizes, yeah, they're playing no fun and this is no fun. And they, they've kind of become what they set out not to be, which is right. proper rock and roll band. Right. And First Pistols album is perfect, but it also leaves them no space to go anywhere else. Hmm. And that's a certain tragedy, but live fast, die young is, is yeah. kind of the punk mantra and sometimes it applies to bands as well. It is a perfect album, and it's still relevant. Oh, yeah, it's still great. I mean, I played uh, Anarchy in the UK on my Sirius show uh, right, the other right. night. It's just a marvelously, con it's too good. It's not punk rock. It's a great <laughs> rock record. And that's, in the end, if you want to destroy something, they're in, right in the tradition of the Small Facers or the Who or Motley oh, yeah, Absolutely, They made a great rock record. If you want to overthrow something and, and change the channel, you can't just do something that builds on the bones of the past. Thanks for uh, sharing your time with me, guys, and uh, letting me have a chance book. to uh, strike some lightning on Cygnus. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. take care, Lenny. All right, bye-bye. I'll see you guys. Take care. Bye-bye now. Thanks a lot. What a great interview. I want to thank our guest, Lenny Kay, and of course my partner in crime, Tom Semioli, for another fabulous and informative interview. I would encourage all of you to go out, pick up a copy of Lenny's new and fantastic book, Lightning Striking, and to keep your Spotify, Google, YouTube, or whatever handy, because you'll want to listen to all of the tunes Lenny recommends throughout the book. I would also like to encourage you, if you've missed any of our previous shows or want to listen again, we invite you to our podcast, also titled Notes from an Artist, which you can find on all major podcast players or at notesfromanartist.buzzsprout.com. So this is David Gross for Tom Semioli and Lenny Kay. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week where our guest will be the great album artist and raconteur, Johannes. We'll see you then. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. 